Great. Well, thank you, everyone. It's really, really awesome to be here. And uh, if I was going to sum up my whole talk in one sentence, it is that generational thinking is a really powerful idea that's been horribly corrupted by terrible myths, stereotypes, and cliches. So when you look back at the academic history of generational thinking, it brings in some of the biggest philosophers and sociologists in our history. Uh, people like a French philosopher, Auguste Comte, who actually thought that generational change was the key driver of the speed of societal change. So he said things like this. Uh, we should not hide the fact that uh, our, pro our social progress rests essentially upon death, which I realize is not a very cheery subject for a Saturday afternoon at a talk like this. But what Comte meant was that we get stuck in our ways once we get past a certain age. So the successive steps of humanity necessarily require a continuous renovation from one generation uh, to the next. So these are big ideas of uh, life and death and societal change. So it's a shame that the type of generational analysis we get more commonly today are things like this, uh, that millennials <laughs> are killing the napkin industry. And I could spend the next 15 minutes talking about things millennials are supposed to have been killed. Any millennials in the audience, you should be ashamed of yourselves for killing <laughs> all these things. But it's not just millennials who get picked on. Baby boomers also get a lot of stick. Uh, not for killing things, so much as ruining them. Uh, in this case, ruining everything, um, according to this Atlantic article. And this sort of sense of generational conflict bleeds into all sorts of really big issues. We're in, in, unthinkingly encouraging generational conflict on big things like climate change. So when Greta Thunberg was made Person of the Year by Time magazine in 2019, they called her a standard bearer in a generational battle between old and young. Um, the US singer Billie Eilish was more direct. She said, hopefully the adults and old people start listening to us about climate change. Old people are going to die and don't really care if we die, but we don't want to die yet, said Billie. Um, and I love Billie Eilish, uh, but that's quite an extreme representation of older people's views, I think we'll, we'll find. Um, but it's also quite common. It comes across in lots of the narratives we see around climate change. The trouble is, when you look at the evidence, it's just not true. There is no real generational break in concern about the environment. This is the proportion of American adults thinking that the rise in world temperature caused by the greenhouse effect is extremely or very dangerous. And what I do is I split it between the five generational groups, uh, look at the differences over time, and you can see there is a bit of a difference. Gen Z millennials slightly more likely to agree with that, but not much. It's a few percentage points, nothing like the narrative you will see in the media on this. And when you look at other types of measures, like whether you boycott things for social purpose reasons, services or products, it's actually baby boomers and Gen X who are more likely to do that than young people. So not only is this not true, I think it's quite dangerous because this is things like climate change. We need people to come together. Uh, but what we're doing instead is artificially defining them across these generational and age-based uh, lines. And that's not the only thing that we divide generations on. Uh, the culture war, which gets a lot of focus right now, is seen to be driven by a new generation of snowflakes or social uh, justice warriors. And this is another misdirection. It's a slightly different misdirection, <clears throat> because in this case, young and old are different on attitudes to race, immigration, gender equality, identity, etc., all those types of things. But the key point is, that's always the case. Uh, young are always more comfortable with changing social norms than older groups. In fact, when I look back over the decades of data on this, it's, the young are usually about twice as likely to be comfortable with changing social norms as the old. So you can look at different sorts of eras in the mid-1980s <clears throat> when baby boomers were the younger adult generation at the time. They were half as likely as their parents, the pre-war generation, to say th agree with things like women should stay at home and men should go out to work. But you roll that forward to 2021, and you change the issue to pride in the British Empire. Uh, it's actually that well, now you've got a younger generation of Gen Z, older generation of baby boomers, and Gen Z half as likely as baby boomers to be proud of the British Empire. So the issues change, but the gap between old and young stays about the same uh, throughout lots of different sorts of issues. And that explains why. It's part of the explanation of why that there's this constant of history that thinking today's young are uniquely wrong or weird is something you see throughout history. So you can go back to 400 BC, 
Uh, and Socrates, in a very long diatribe against young people of his day, uh, said, the children now love luxury, they have bad manners, they show disrespect for their elders and love gossip in the place of activity. But you can go to any point in history and see the same sort of thing. I like this one from 1771, letter to the town and country magazine that called young people of that day a race of effeminate, self-admiring, emaciated fribbles. <laughs> which is a great phrase and more or less a definition of snowflake just 250 years uh, before uh, we had uh, the term. But I think it's true to say it does feel more divided by age than it has done in the past, and I think there's two main reasons for that. Uh, one of them is that we've got a more fractious media, social media, and political environment where this information environment is set up to cause division, to spread division. We know divisive information travels further and faster. Same sort of thing in our politics. And that's relatively uh, well known if a massive challenge for society. This, I think, is less well known. We're living through what US academics call a dangerous experiment in age segregation, where humans are living uh, more separately by age group than we have done in the whole of human history. It's maybe a bit more recognized in the US, but not at all here, but we have a very similar sort of pattern. Uh, as this chart shows, this is the old age dependency ratio, which is basically the proportion of pensionable age people versus the proportion of working age people in different types of areas, from villages through towns up to large, sit uh, large towns through to core cities, the biggest cities. And you see, up till 1991, each of these different types of areas were more or less had the same age mix. We were all mixed up in different, all of these different types of areas. But since 1991, we've had this incredible splaying apart, where towns and cities, uh, towns and villages are getting older, and cities and large towns are getting younger to a big degree. We are living more separately than we have, and that's a relatively new thing for us in terms of human history. And I'd say it's worse than that, because we're also living very separate digital lives. Our digital lives are more important to us now uh, than they were in the past, uh, and we're doing, it, we're doing it very different things online between the different generations. We've got a sense that older people are more online than they were in the past, and that's true, but it's just still the biggest gaps that I see in my analysis is, uh, are on generation or on these types of technological uh, behaviors. So this is a proportion of French adults who use online social networks every day, and you've got these enormous gaps between the different groups. So Gen Z, nearly every Gen Z person is online uh, in social media every day. Big jump down to millennials, bigger jump down to Gen X, my generation, uh, then hardly any baby boomers and pre-war generation doing that. So we're doing different things online, different places to different intensities, and that separates us too. And this separation fuels the stereotyping between the different generations. And some of that's just good fun. Some of the stereotyping is just good fun. Has anyone seen this Facebook group? A group where we all pretend to be boomers. It's really, it's worth a look. It was set up by two American 20-year-olds. And the only rule of the group is you have to post as if you're a baby boomer, as in you don't know the rules of social media. So you've got lots of capitalized political rants like this. My grandson forgot to call me on my birthday. Thanks, Obama. Uh, loads and loads of disgusting medical queries that people, <laughs> people come up with. Uh, in baby boomer voices, and the ones that make me giggle the most, and this says more about me than uh, anything I think of these ones, with really sad messages <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, <laughs> with inappropriate uh, backgrounds. Um, so it is, it's just good fun. Some of this is just good fun. The interesting thing, though, from the people who set it up and the moderators is that they have to moderate it quite actively because it quickly tips into more dangerous stereotypes around racism or sexism or homophobia among older people. So even in that kind of space, the separation can have dangerous consequences. But more generally, this sort of um, focus on these tropes or stereotypes between generations is a real shame because it's distracting us from really big, true generational differences. And a lot of those are economic uh, right now, with the extraordinary concentration in wealth by generation. One of the big stories of the last 30 years of economics has been uh, the growth in private wealth and how much more important private wealth is to your economic success compared to income. But within that, there's been this extraordinary concentration of wealth by when you were born, by your generation. 
was this. Baby boomers just shooting away. This is US data, the share of national wealth owned by each generation by looking at the same age points for the different generations. You can see baby boomers shooting away. <clears throat> and you can compare uh, the different generations at the same average age using these types of charts. And what that shows is that in the US, when baby boomers were an average age of 45, they owned 42 percent of the US uh, total wealth. Generation X, my generation, only owned 15 percent of, the, of their wealth at the same age. And poor millennials haven't even really uh, got started in the US. Um, and we can see that around different countries in the world. And a lot of that is driven by house price booms. Not all of it, but a lot of it is driven by house price booms. Uh, and you can see a mirror pattern in the extraordinary change in home ownership in places like uh, Britain. So if you compare that by generations over time, pre-war generation and the baby boomer generation actually followed an incredibly similar path uh, over time, uh, where they both ended up with around 80% of the, each generation owning their own home. My generation, Generation X, it looked like we were going to be racing up to meet them, and then just got deflected away. You can see very different life paths coming out in this, these types of charts. De deflected away by the huge increase in house prices in the early 2000s, and then the financial crash that followed, that tightened lots of the lending rules. And again, poor millennials, way down here, never really uh, got started. But it's even worse than that for young people. Because not only do they have a much tougher context, they also got blame for that context uh, as well. You may have seen this article by Kirsty Alsop from early on uh, this year, at which it did really spark a Twitter debate because what Kirsty effectively said was it was young people's fault themselves for not being able to buy their own homes because when she bought her first property, going abroad with the EasyJet lifestyle, coffee, gym, Netflix subscriptions, all of those things didn't exist. And that's why. Nothing to do with a huge increase in house prices, wage stagnation, or tighter lending rules, according to Kirsty. Uh, and I'm much more with Matt Zarb Cousins, who said, to be fair to Kirsty Olsop, if you cancelled your Netflix and Pure Gym subscription instead, save that £40 a month, as long as the housing market doesn't go up at all, then in just 54 years, <laughs> you'll have enough for a deposit on an average uh, house. Um, but, as you know, younger generations are always inventive, always coming up with uh, new adaptations to these sorts of challenges, and I particularly like uh, the millennials' uh, response to this. They have their own plan for their future, <laughs> for their future retirement. I, this is for sale, and I particularly love it's done in cross-stitch, which is such a, a millennial uh, thing uh, to do. Um, but then, so finally, to sum up then, um, my key points are to ditch this misuse of the label, but try to keep hold of the bigger thinking of generational differences. Because when you're born does matter. Uh, people born with the same socioeconomic circumstances at different times had very different life chances because of these big economic factors. And on the more of the social and cultural side of things, generations are really important to understand because they do change society. Compt is correct. They do move society uh, forward. What we've got to do is ignore most of the generational analysis that you will see, unfortunately, because it's a mix of fake conflicts and an, uh, almost an astrological approach of horoscopes for different generations. Wall Street Journal did a bit of analysis of LinkedIn, and there is actually over 400 people on LinkedIn that call themselves millennial consultants, which is millions of people that they're supposed to have insight uh, into. But finally, from me, you always, when you're doing this type of research, you have to be aware of your own prejudices and priors, and I think maybe part of my suspicion of generational labels is that I'm Gen X and no one ever talks about us. There's probably quite a few Generation X. <laughs> In the, in the room. Uh, I've got a lot of sympathy with Jonathan Walker, who says, I'm neither a millennial nor a boomer. I come from a generation so irrelevant that people can't even be bothered to hate us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.